Good morning, and welcome to our Sunday morning worship at the Richfield Church of Christ. I'm glad you're joining me today uh, for our sermon and our time taking communion together. I pray that you're doing well. We continue to miss all of you. We're thankful that you're uh, serving the Lord where you are, watching online, uh, being faithful to God day by day in your work and in your relationships. Uh, we long for you, we love you, and we pray for you. And, but we're glad that at least we can do this together. Uh, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 29 and 30. If you want to turn there in your Bibles, that's where we'll be uh, talking today. But I want to begin with a question. Is what do you do, what do we do, when we encounter stress, hardship, tragedy in our lives? What do you do? And another question that kind of follows up on that is, where do you go for help? Where do you go for help when everything seems to be going wrong? You know, this last year has been hard for so many of us. Uh, it's been filled with disappointments, discouragements, uh, loss. Uh, many of you have been have experienced sickness or loss of others that you love. Uh, maybe you've experienced a financial loss. Uh, and in many ways, what this year has done is not only is it have we seen great tragedy, great struggle in our world, but it's also opened our eyes to some of our own personal struggles. Uh, in our interior lives, in our emotional life, our spiritual life, our physical life, uh, it's made us more aware of some things. I, and, and what I want to say with that is that it's made us aware of what was already there. Uh, the, the troubles of this last year uh, didn't put some of the struggles inside of us there. Uh, it just pulled back the curtain to help us see what we are really like. If we were to have all the things that we count on taken away from us, uh, if some of the freedoms, the privileges we enjoy uh, in our context and in our life, if all those things were stripped away, uh, if the way we are used to doing our work was taken away, if the way that we were used to being a church was taken away, uh, who would we be? And what this year is, it's revealed who we are on the inside, both the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I think every one of us can say we have seen some of all three, good, bad, and ugly. Uh, recently, I finished a book uh, that I found really helpful for myself called Managing Leadership Anxiety by an author named Steve Cuss. And I've also started listening uh, to his podcast on, about the same thing. It's called, also called Managing Leadership Anxiety. And in the podcast, uh, Cuss, this author, this minister, uh, interviews different ministry leaders uh, and other leaders, and he asks them uh, different questions about their life, about their work, about uh, anxiety, about stress in their life. Uh, and But one question that I, I like that he always asks every person he interviews uh, is, where does anxiety start for you physiologically? And this is how he typically asks it. Uh, is it a spinning mind? So do you usually, are your thoughts racing? Are you cycling through the same thoughts again and again? Is your mind just spinning out of control when you're dealing with something that causes you anxiety, sadness, madness, fear? Uh, or is it a racing heart? Do you feel your anxiety uh, in your chest? Is your heart beating so fast? Do you have trouble breathing as you're dealing with anxiety? Uh, and for some people, it's there. And then the, the last one, or is it a is it a tightening gut? Do you feel it in your stomach when you're under a lot of stress? Everything just feels tight, uh, and you know that's just something wrong. And, and Cuss says uh, that typically we can experience all three of those things, but usually it begins with one for most of us. Now, for me, uh, when I'm feeling stress or anxiety, it usually begins with a spinning mind is that my thoughts are just kind of racing and I'm cycling through a problem. I'm rethinking thoughts again and again and replaying situations in my mind, uh, trying to think through what would I do if this happened or, or what would I do to go back and redo this situation. And what happens is, why that's a helpful question is, is that it can begin to help us think about our emotional responses, uh, our spiritual life, when we're dealt situations that are difficult, when we have conflict, when we uh, have experiences that discourage us and make us afraid or angry, is to notice these things, notice that we are feeling anxiety, and begin to figure out how do I manage this so that whatever response I make is a God-honoring one and a response that will bless others rather than destroy them or destroy me. And typically when we're under stress, we all as human beings our brain uh, tells us that we need to do typically one of two things, right? So when you felt under stress, you've heard this before, is you've either felt like, I need to fight, 
or I need to flight. I need to run away. And so some of us, when we, we put in stressful situations, uh, some of us power up. We uh, raise our voices. We mm, flex our muscles. We get really agitated and we express it in a way that, that comes across, maybe is threatening to others. Uh, we're ready to fight. We're ready to duke it out. Uh, and sometimes that's when we make some of the worst mistakes we, we ever make is we say things we shouldn't, uh, we do things we shouldn't, we later regret how we responded to, to this other person because of our anxiety in the moment. For others of us, our response is, is different. When put in a stressful situation, our desire is to, uh, to withdraw, to withdraw from the relationship, to re- withdraw from the situation or the person or the place, whatever it is that's causing us our anxiety. And we may avoid it, uh, we may hide, we may uh, hold our thoughts in rather than expressing them. Uh, and, and in those situations as well, we may be doing something that is actually sinful, that's unhelpful, that doesn't actually uh, allow us to trust God or to be kind or bless the other person with the truth of what we may need to say in a gracious and loving way. And so what if there was a different way? What if there was an alternative option when we can feel the anxiety rising in our minds or in our hearts or in our gut? What if there was a different way to respond to these really difficult moments uh, by trusting in God and by having a response that is God-honoring, uh, that is loving, that recognizes that my identity is is tied to who God is and what God has done for me, and I really can I can deal with whatever it is I'm experiencing because I know God is my refuge, God is my security. Now, what we saw last week when we talked about Saul going to the witch, the medium at Endor, uh, to try to get help, to know what to do, is we saw Saul under great distress, great fear. Uh, he had tried to call out to God, but God would not answer him because Saul had again and again rebelled against God. Saul had never actually repented to try and put his life right before God and allow God to work in him. Uh, And he just took his rebellion another step further by going to see this medium. And we see that Saul, when put under great fear, great stress, Saul over and over again chooses not to trust in God, chooses not to obey God, but chooses to do things his own way, and it leads to his own destruction. Now in chapter 29 and 30, we see David put in, in, in situations that cause him fear, that cause him unsure, unsurety about what's going to happen, anxiety about his future. And what we see is that David is being contrasted very clearly with Saul because what will David do? David will seek the Lord and he will find strength in God. His faith will be strengthened in God before he takes any kind of action. And we see that David's actions that he takes because they come from a place of Uh, clearly his identity is rooted in God's love for him, God's care for him. David is able to treat others with generosity, grace, kindness, and David is able to take uh, clear action directed by the will of God rather than his own fears and anxieties. And so uh, let's get into this story. I'm going to ask you to read chapter 29 on your own time if you want, but what I'm going to do is just summarize it so that we can get into chapter 30. In chapter 29, we're stepping back a few days. You remember probably that uh, David and his men were still living in Ziklag, and David and his men were serving Achish, the king of Gath, uh, and they had been asked to accompany the Philistine army on their way to battle with Israel. Now, at the beginning of chapter 29, the Philistines have encamped at a place called Aphek, And the other Philistine commanders of the army hear that there are a group of Hebrews, including David, uh, the former servant of Saul, among them. And these Philistine rulers hear about this and they become angry. They're furious with Achish and they're afraid uh, that if we leave David in our army, he could turn on us at any moment, win favor back with Saul, and cause us all to die or lose the battle. And so we have no desire to have David and his men come with us. And so they tell Achish this. Achish goes to David and says to David, I'm sorry. I know I've, I've loved you. You've been so trustworthy. You've done such good stuff for me. And Achish is deceived. He doesn't know what David's really doing. All he knows is that David has been bringing him plunder from the raids he's been making. And he thinks David's been raiding uh, Judah. He thinks David's been attacking Israel, but David is not. David's been attacking the enemies of the Lord and bringing back the plunder to Achish. He then says about David, you're like an angel of God to me. Uh, I've made you my bodyguard, and I trust you, and I know you would do a good thing. And David's response is kind of a uh, 
you know, it's not clear. It's like, oh, what have I done uh, that you would send me away? Uh, I really am disappointed that I don't need to get to fight my king's enemies. And the, the nuance in that is it's not clear whose enemies, which king uh, is David referring to. Is he referring to Achish's enemies or is he more likely referring to God's enemies that David thought in this moment going into battle, he would have an opportunity uh, to turn on the Philistines and defeat them and show Israel his true loyalty to his own people. Now, what actually happens is that David and his men are sent away. Uh, they're told to leave uh, before Philistia gets to Shunem and encamps there, um, before they're going to battle Israel. And what, what we, I think, should see in that chapter is, here is the providence of God at work again in David's life, is that God is providing David with a clear alibi uh, that he would have no responsibility, play no part in the death of Saul and the failure of Israel in battle. And so uh, David and his men will be able to say on the day when the Philistines are defeating Saul and his sons in Israel is that we were 100 miles away. Actually, we were 100 miles away doing the Lord's will by fighting and defeating the Amalekites. And so God is, again, providentially caring for David by removing him from a situation that would have hurt his later kingship and caused Israel to wonder if they could trust him. Uh, but by removing him, not only is he protecting David's future kingship, but he is sending David and his men back to Ziklag in time so that they can do something about a tragedy that is about to occur in the life of their families. And so pick up with me in chapter 30 of 1 Samuel, and we're going to actually read the text of chapter 30 together as we talk about it. Chapter 30, and let's start with verses 1 through 8 together. Now, when David and his men came to Ziklag, on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negeb and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire, and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire, and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives also had been taken captive, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, Bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David, and David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? He answered, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake and shall surely rescue. Okay, so the story begins is that David and his men, after leaving the Philistine army, they have made a 55-mile journey back to Ziklag. It's taken them about three days. They arrive on the third day. And while they were gone, the Amalekites, the enemies of God's people, who David has actually been raiding different Amalekite villages and defeating them, uh, not leaving any of them alive. But these Amalekites have come, and they have burned the city of Ziklag to the ground, and they have taken all their possessions, all their wives and children. Everything of value has been taken away. Thankfully, they had not killed any of their wives or children, likely to keep them uh, as bargaining chips to sell into slavery to use for whatever purposes they desired. And what they have done is a capital offense, according to the Torah. Kidnapping uh, was condemned by the Torah, and the, the punishment for committing such kinds of acts was death. And so David and his men, uh, who were arriving in Ziklag happy, probably, that they did not have to go into battle with the Philistines, uh, didn't have to be in a difficult situation, have now had their happiness turned into incredible sorrow, incredible sadness because of what they have lost. And these are some of the toughest men uh, you can imagine in, who have ever lived, who have fought so many battles, and yet did you see what they did in the text in response to their wife, the loss of their wives and children uh, by kidnapping is that they, they weep and they weep until they are so exhausted they can't weep anymore. They have been broken down by this situation. Uh, and not only are they, are they depressed and sad, including David, um, it tells us that they especially grieved the loss of their sons and daughters. And they are probably imagining what could be happening to their children at this very moment while they are away from them. And so the text tells us that these people, these soldiers, they became bitter in spirit or bitter in soul. Uh, 
They're angry and they want somebody to do something about what's gone wrong, right? You can feel their anger and their bitterness and their despair in this story and, and identify with that with them. Uh, but they take their bitterness and it turns into rage and anger and it's focused on David. It's focused on their leader who they believe is responsible for what's happened to them. And they're so angry, they're so bitter that they're saying, we ought to stone David. This is all his fault. And we're told in the text that David was greatly distressed by all this. As any leader faced with this situation would have been, uh, David is greatly distressed. Uh, he probably feels in some ways responsible for what was happened, even though it was out of his control. Uh, he's been leading these men on raids against the Amalekites for the last 16 months, and he probably feels like this is his fault. But when faced with this moment of great anxiety, great fear, great sadness, great anger being directed toward him, notice what David does. David does not fight against his own people. He doesn't attack his men who are calling for his death. He doesn't respond uh, in a way that was ungodly toward them. He also doesn't run away. He doesn't say, I can't handle this. I'm out. Good luck. You guys do your own thing. He doesn't walk away from the situation and, and try to avoid it. Instead, I think David models for us a third option. What can we do when faced with these situations? He did what he could. He went to the Lord. And the text tells us that David found strength in the Lord his God. David found strength in the Lord his God. He uh, went to the Lord, and he put his trust in the Lord, and he said, God, I don't know what's what's going to happen in this situation. Uh, God has not yet told David that it's going to work out for the good or for the bad. David has no idea what the outcome will be or what God will do, but what David does when faced with this difficult, distressing moment is that he strengthened himself in the Lord. And we're going to talk about that more, is when we're faced with similar moments, what would it look like for us to choose to strengthen ourselves in the Lord? And how David finds strength in the Lord, uh, he is very different from Saul, right? So I said that Saul and David are being contrasted really clearly. Back in chapter 28, we were told about Saul that he says, I am in great distress in 28 verse 15. And the same, very similar thing is said about David as David was greatly distressed in chapter 30. But again, both of them have very different responses. David will strengthen himself the Lord in the Lord, and David will seek the Lord through his appointed method of hearing his word by trying to uh, inquire of the Lord, what am I supposed to do in this situation? What is your will? And so David called for Abiathar, the priest, and Abiathar, the priest, brings David the ephod, which would have had the Urim and the Thummim in the breastpiece of the ephod. And so uh, this would allow him to inquire of God, what shall we do? And God tells David that that he and his men should pursue the Amalekites because they will surely, certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. David, go. Go quickly, and you're going to defeat the Amalekites. You're going to bring back your families and your children. Go. And so where Saul had defied God's word, David will seek God's word, listen to God's word, and live in obedience to his word. And he will receive the promise of life and blessing because of his trust in God. So let's keep reading in the chapter and see what happens. Uh, pick with me, up with me at verse 9, and we'll keep reading together. And David, uh, excuse me, verse 9. So David set out and the 600 men who were with him, and they came to the brook Besor, where those who were left behind stayed. But David pursued he and 400 men. 200 stayed behind who were too exhausted to cross the brook Besor. They found an Egyptian in the open country, and brought him to David, and they gave him bread, and he ate, they gave him water to drink, and they gave him a piece of cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit revived, for he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. And David said to him, To whom do you belong, and where are you from? He said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me behind, because I fell sick three days ago. We had made a raid against the Negev of the Carathites, and against that which belongs to Judah, and against the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, Will you take me down to this man, band? And he said, Swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this band. And when he had taken him down, behold, 
They were spread abroad all over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. And David struck them down from twilight until the evening of the next day, and not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who mounted camels and fled. David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken, and David rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken. David brought back all. David also captured all the flocks and herds and the people who dro drove the livestock before him and said, this is David's spoil. Okay, so David and his 600 men, uh, they will travel about 16 miles south to a place called the Bessor Ravine or to where the Brook of Bessor uh, is located. And at that point in the story, 200 of these 600 men say, we cannot go any further. We are so exhausted. We're so worn out. We, we, we have to stop. And you can imagine this why they've traveled over the last few days 55 miles from Aphek to Ziklag and now they've traveled an additional 16 miles and they are not only physically spent but they're emotionally spent because of everything they have lost and endured this day and so 200 stay behind at the Brook Bessor leaving four, David and 400 men to continue the journey now as they're going another providential act of God happens for them is right as they are traveling along, they meet an Egyptian in a field who has been left behind, who is sick, who is dying uh, when he's discovered. Uh, but David realizes this is a potential opportunity for blessing. So David and his men, uh, they treat this Egyptian man with incredible kindness and grace and generosity. Uh, they feed him water uh, and they give him a dessert as well. They give him the uh, figs and the excuse me, the other kind of fruit, I forget what it was, but they take great care of this man. And what David is doing is he has been kind and gracious in his treatment of this Egyptian who is a sojourner uh, in the land and who is a foreigner. And God had expected his people to treat foreigners, to treat sojourners with kindness, with grace, with mercy, especially Egyptians, because Israel had been sojourners in the land of Egypt. And so David does all this without knowing if there will be any true benefit to him. But when the Egyptian is revived, when he's feeling better and able to talk to them, what we find out is that truly God is at work in this story. Is that this Egyptian is a servant of an Amalekite who had fallen sick three days before and his Amalekite master had said, he's not worth the trouble, leave him behind. And it's this act of ungrace by an Amalekite master and this act of grace by David to this foreign Egyptian that leads David and his men to success in what God has promised to do for them. And God's work in it all is something of beauty. And so the Egyptian is able to lead them to where they are. David asks, will you be willing to lead me down to this raiding party? And the Egyptian knows that he is in a vulnerable situation. And he says to David, as long as you promise, you vow by your God that you won't kill me and you won't hand me over to my master, I will help you. And so this Egyptian led them to the camp. When they arrive at the camp, David and his men find the Amalekites scattered over the countryside. And they're having themselves a big old time. They're drinking, they're eating, they're partying uh, because they've had such a great plunder and victory in battle. And what this means is that they're in no condition. They're not prepared for the battle that's coming to them. And the text tells us that David and his men fought from dusk until the evening of the next day. This is a long battle. For exhausted men, and yet what we're told is they wiped out almost all of the Amalekites that, that day, except for 400 young men who escaped on Campbell's and got away. And what's so beautiful about this story is that here David is doing what Saul never did. David is fulfilling the command of God about dealing with the Amalekites, and David is so successful in it that the Amalekites will not be a substantial enemy for Israel again uh, to be mentioned until the time of Hezekiah. And then later in the story of Esther, the main villain in the story, Haman, uh, is a descendant of the Amalekites. And so David is very successful. And what we're told is that he recovers the people, the possessions. Nothing is missing. Everyone is safe. All the wives, the women, the children have all been found. And not only that, but David has also recovered the loot, the plunder that the Amalekites had taken from others. And so they have gained extra flocks and herds, property and blessings that will be divided among his troops. And so this is a, a credible moment. 
And then let's see what happens as the story goes to an end of how this uh, plunder will be shared, how they will return home, and what God will use David to do with the blessings he's given him. Uh, Pick up with me at verse 21. Then David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow David and who had been left at the brook Besor. And they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near to the people, he greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless fellows among the men who had gone with David said, Because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except that each man may lead away his wife and children and depart. But David said, You shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. He has preserved us and given into our hand the band that came against against us. Who would listen to you in this matter? For as his share is who goes down into the battle, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage. They shall share alike. And he made it a statute and a rule for Israel from that day forward to this day. When David came to Ziklag, he sent part of the spoil to his friends, the elders of Judah, saying, Here is a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. It was for those in Bethel, in Ramoth, of the Negeb, in Jatir, in Aroer, in Shipmoth, in Eshtemoah, in Rakal, in the cities of the Jeremalites, in the cities of the Kenites, in Horma, in Borashan, in Athak, in Hebron, were all the places where David and his men had roamed. So David, who is obedient to God's commands, we see also in his character that he is the kind of king who will be just and gracious in his care for those who follow him. So David and his victorious 400 men and their wives and children and their loot all travel back to the Brook Besor. And at the Brook Besor, where the 200 men were left behind, um, he inquires about how they are doing. David cares about those he leads. He doesn't rebuke or discourage these men for their inability to participate in the battle. Uh, but he is thankful for them and what they have done by staying with the baggage. But the four, among the 400 men who had gone into battle and were victorious, we're told in the text that there were some of them who were troublesome, some of them who were uh, wicked, discouraging, ungracious, and unkind men, who resented the 200 men who had not gone with them in battle. And their recommendation was, these 200 men deserve nothing except for their own wives and children. They can have their wives and children and they can go. But David will not allow this. David says, no, this is not, not the way things will be. And he creates a statute and an ordinance that will carry forward by his authority for generations to come in the life of Israel. And he basically says that the share for those who stayed with the supplies and the baggage, it will be the same as those who went into battle. And the reason David can say this is because he knows everything that they have received back today is not because of their own power, their own wisdom, their own ability. It is because the gracious hand of God has gone with them, has led the way, and has provided for them their families, their children, and all of these other blessings again. And he says to them, not only is everything we've received by the gracious gift of God, we are undeserving of it, uh, but we also know is that God has given us something even greater than all the things that we've gotten. All the plunder is that God delivered our lives. We didn't die in battle. And he gave us a victory over this enemy. What else could you want? Uh, and so he reminds them of, of this reality that he's going to be just. He's going to be fair in his leadership. And that they as a corporate group together should treat each other with kindness, fairness, love, and generosity. And he says, you know, this is the nature of the way a military works or the way any kind of group works, whether it's a family or a military or a church or an organization, is that the success of a military operation uh, requires the performance of many different tasks. Some of those tasks are not done on the front lines of battle. Some of those tasks are done behind the scenes by those who are staying behind. And he says each job is vital for the success of the whole. These men that have stayed back, what they did for us was vital and important and that we will all share in the fruits of our success together. That is what it truly means to be a team, as everybody shares in both the successes and in the struggles of being a part of whatever organization it is. And so David shows his own godliness, his gracious character, as he leads for and blesses his people. And not only does he bless his soldiers and their families, but he also chooses to use some of these blessings that he's received by the hand of God to send them as gifts to the the towns of Judah, to the elders of Judah, as a way of saying, uh, I'm grateful for you. He sends it to the places where he and his men had roamed while he was in exile in Israel. And not only is he blessing them, he's preparing the way for his coming kingship among the people of Israel. 
And he's, in a sense, making an announcement that he is God's anointed king, the one who fights against the Lord's enemies and the one who blesses and gives to the Lord's people. And so he will one day stand as king because of what God has done. Here's the question we need to bring this lesson to an end is, what is the source of our strength? Where do we find strength when our lives are troubled, when we find ourselves in stressful situations, plagued by hardship? David tells us that he found strength in the Lord his God. And this is before David ever received a word of promise that this was going to work out for his good, is that above all else, he found strength and hope in God. And this is where we begin, is no matter the outcome of whatever troubling situation we find ourselves in, when we're feeling anxiety, when we're feeling fear or anger or sadness, the first thing we ought to do is go to the Lord again and remind ourselves of who we are in Christ Jesus, strengthen ourselves in the Lord. And as a part of being strengthened in the Lord, it means that we're a people who are, are praying, who are completely dependent on God's help, who are seeking Him for answers, seeking Him for direction, seeking Him for what kind of people we ought to be. And it means that we're also willing to listen to the Word of God. And when we hear the Word of God, when we hear its direction in our lives, we're willing to obey it, trusting that God knows what is best for us. You know, David helps us see that, that only in God do we find our true strength. And the life of faith involves both our participation, uh, our obedience, our willingness to act, and it involves God's work in our lives. Uh, this is said again and again in Scripture, is that not only does God give us His grace, His mercy, His blessing, His work in our lives, but we respond to that by trying to live in obedience as disciples of Jesus. Uh, so Paul is able to say to the Philippian church, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And he also says to them, that it is God who works in you. It's both of these together uh, that constitute a life of faith. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, Paul is able to say to these Christians that they need to remember that they were saved by grace through faith, not by works. Uh, but he also then declares to them that even though it's the grace of God that has been working their lives to deliver them uh, from sin and from death in Jesus, is that their response is that God has created them to do good works for his glory. You know, uh, we need our faith in God to be strengthened. Uh, there may not be a promise of a successful rescue in the here and now, uh, but when we're faced with these situations, we need to strengthen ourselves in the Lord and allow God to strengthen us. God is the means. God is not the means to an end. He is the end. He is the goal of our lives. He is what we were made for. And it's only in Him that we will find our strength and our joy and our purpose. Jesus in His prayer to the Father in John 17 said this, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And this is what we need to know, is that a full life comes from knowing God and finding our strength and our hope in Him. And so today, as you look at the past year, where is it that you are drawing your strength from? Where is your hope coming from? You know, I read a quote this week, and I want to share it with you. There are a lot of people who are looking at the events of their life uh, over the past year and saying, I wish I could forget it. I wish I could move past it. I wish this had never happened. But I want you to hear this quote and think about what it has to say to us where we are right now. As long as we keep dividing our lives between events and people we would like to remember and those we would rather forget, we cannot claim the fullness of our beings as a gift of God to be grateful for. Let's not be afraid to look at everything that has brought us to where we are now and trust that we will soon see it in the guiding hand of a loving God. And this is a quote by Henry Nouwen. And what that quote is telling us is there, there are moments, there are events, there are people in our lives that our very unspiritual, uh, unhealthy side of us say, I wish I never had to deal with that. I wish I never had to know that person. I wish I could forget what happened. And what Nouwen is saying, and I think what we need to hear uh, from the stories of scripture is uh, rather than saying, I just wish I could forget that. I wish that I'd never had to go through that is to instead embrace those moments, embrace those people and say, uh, yes, that was painful to go through. Yes, that year was disappointing. But if I look at it with eyes of faith, God's gracious hand has been involved all along the way. And I would not be who I am today unless God had been at work through all these moments to guide me, to strengthen me, to help me, even when I felt alone and afraid. And it's this God of grace, this God of mercy, this God of generous provision 
who has shown up in our story all along the way. And did you see that in the text again and again? This is a story of God's grace, of God's favor, of God's blessing on people who are undeserving. God's grace that David would be providentially moved back to Ziklag when he needed to be there to begin to deliver his family. God's grace that he would be with David and give him a word of encouragement when he felt like he didn't know what to do. God's grace and generosity showing up in David's life when David blesses this Egyptian who becomes the providential key to lead them to the Amalekites. God's grace uh, when faced with a group of ungraceful men who wanted to take away blessings from their brothers who through David says, no, we need to treat one another with love and generosity because of what God has done for us here today. How can we treat each other any other way? And so with David, we can, we can hear the words of Jesus, I think. There's a parable that Jesus tells in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16, where there is a landowner who chooses to pay uh, the people who are working for him uh, the same pay regardless of when they started working. So the ones who started working in the early morning uh, and who had worked hard all day long, God pays them exactly the same as those who had started in the afternoon or a couple hours before the workday was over. And, and the early workers get angry and they said, God, how can you do this to us? This is unjust. This is unfair. And God's response to those people is, uh, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? And what Jesus is saying is, we serve a generous God who wants to shower his grace on people regardless of how long they have served him, as long as they served him and put their trust in Jesus the Son. And what David is telling his followers is a new kingdom has come, and under this new kingdom, this is a kingdom where the outcast will be welcomed, those who were in distress or in debt or discontented. These are the kinds of people that made up David's 600 men and their families, and they were welcomed by David and valued and treated with kindness. David says this is a kingdom where the oppressed and the foreigner will be find welcome and generous love by taking care of this, Egypt, of this Egyptian. This is a kingdom where David says God has graciously provided us with victory, with provision, with our families, with our children, with all these blessings. And these blessings will be shared among us and they will be shared by God's people living in Judah. And all of this points us to a greater reality of what Jesus, our anointed king, would do for us as God's people. Is that in God's gracious love, he has provided for us his precious son, Jesus. And he has invited us into a kingdom, a kingdom marked not by scarcity, but a kingdom marked by generosity, love, and kindness. And when we look at the kingdom of God, we see that God has poured his grace through Jesus, on those who will trust him and be his disciples, grace that was undeserved and unworthy, grace that we, are, we stand under every day and we ought to say, how is it that I am a servant of Jesus, living in the kingdom of God, forgiven of my sins, having the Spirit living in, living in me? And Titus, uh, the friend and co-worker of Paul, uh, when Paul writes to Titus, he says in Titus chapter 3, uh, verses 5 through 7, these words, He saved us. Talking about God, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Paul says, we've not done anything that merits our salvation, but God has saved us through the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us his righteousness through his death on the cross. And it's this generous love that we ought to remember now as we prepare to take communion together. Pray with me for the bread. God, we thank you for the body of Jesus given for us. Thank you that he died. Thank you that he generously offers us forgiveness and love and a place in your kingdom. Father, where all of us share in your blessings equally, we are grateful that we all have salvation, your spirit, a place in your family, God. Bless us now as we break bread together. Help us to live in unity and love as the body of Christ. And pray with me now for the cup. God, we thank you for the Lord Jesus who shed his precious blood for our sins. Help us to follow him, to love him, to be grateful for what he has done, and to offer generous love towards others who are as unworthy as we are. Lord, we thank you for this cup. Bless us as we take it together as the body of Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you again for joining me today. We love you. God bless you. Uh, we are praying for you and hope that you are well.
if there's any way we can serve you, uh, if there's any way we can pray for you, if you're interested in beginning a journey, becoming a disciple of Jesus, and you'd like to study the Bible with us, uh, or have somebody just walk alongside you and pray with you, uh, let us know how we can help you. Uh, you can send us an email to our church email. You can leave a comment uh, on our Facebook or YouTube channel. Uh, you can send us a me message through Facebook Messenger. We'll be glad to connect with you and help you in any way we can. Uh, the Lord bless you and keep you. Have a great day. Thanks for joining me. Love you. Bye.